clock on the f on the computer says five. So we're asking um, to determine the instantaneous velocity, if you want, or the slope of the tangent line at pi over two. So obviously, I really don't really care for this, whatever it is. So I'm asked to find the slope of the tangent at pi over 2, x equals pi over 2. So if you remember, we determined or we created this slope function, which was f of x minus f of pi over 2 over x minus pi over 2, which is 20 cosine t minus, when I plug in pi over 2, cosine pi over 2 is Yes, 0 times 20 is 0, so there is no point in writing that, that over x minus pi over 2. So now all we have to do is go to the graphing calculator, and in y equals, clear everything, put 20 cosine x, close the parentheses, there is no t, so I have to use x, and uh, divide by parentheses. Uh, x minus pi over 2. All I have to do is get closer and closer to pi over 2 as, I, as much as I can. And I have to check because I think the uh, calculator resets. No, okay, not this one. The computer resets itself, but not on this one. Okay, so what is the only number that I cannot plug in? Of course, but if I do, then I, what will I get? Sure, error, of course. If it gives me anything, enter. So here it is, right? So all I have to do is be as close as possible to pi over 2, but not pi over 2 itself. So I'm going to say pi over 2 plus 0.1. And I can continue forever, but this time I'm going to go as close as I can, pi over 2 plus point zero 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 one just give me the answer so the slope of the tangent line to the graph of this function at pi over two is negative twenty so I write negative twenty and that's all I needed to do that's what we did if you go back to your notes you will see that that was what we did Okay, anything else? Other questions for me? Anything else? So I'm hoping now that moving forward, we know what we have to do. To, yes, please, Matt. Can you just explain the uh, limit i, letter i? Is, uh, yes. Limit as x goes to infinity. And then it was e Perfect. Uh, remember, this is the outer function and this is the inner function. In other words, what am I saying by that? If I were to evaluate e to 1 minus x for x equals 5, first I will have to perform 1 minus 5. That's the inner function. And when I'm done and I get a number, then I have to perform another function, right? e to that number. So this is the inner and this is the outer. So I have to determine this first, where 1 minus, go, minus x goes as x approaches infinity. Where does it go? Negative. negative infinity. Now I have to think about e to negative infinity, which I know is 1 over e to infinity. Where will this go? Is that okay? Yes. Yes. Which problem was this? Um, 
Oh, three tangent inverse. That's why I, was, I wasn't sure. OK, good. So this is one of those key functions that we said we have to commit to memory, right? So remember how our tangent looks like. So it's this. So this is the function between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. I start with the function. As x approaches negative infinity, where does this go? Remember, we have to commit this to memory. It's a very important function. So this one goes to negative pi over 2. Now you, you cannot change 2. 2 stays as 2. So this will be 3, negative 3, pi over 2, plus 2. Negative 3, pi over 2, plus 2. Number? What does it say? Right, so all you have to do is write the limit of f of x as x approaches, what was that, uh, 1? Uh, negative 1. Negative 1 equals limit of f of x as x approaches 1 from the right equals f of negative 1 from the right equals f of negative 1. So how much is this from the from the function? Of neg when x approaches negative 1, how much? I, I don't know. Just plug it in. You have to place a, it's a polynomial function, right? How do we find the limit of a polynomial function? Yeah, so what is it? Plug it in and tell me what it is. It's a polynomial function. Of course, that's how we determine the limit of a polynomial function. Good. What about the other one? Doesn't matter. You cannot touch the C, but you're not plugging in C. C is a parameter. You you are determining when X approaches negative one. Minus seven. Good. And how much is F of negative one? Let's look at the function where the function is defined for negative one. Which branch? You cannot choose no, just no, any branch. Six. six. Very good. So now negative six minus seven equals six. Negative c equals 13. c equals negative 13. This is continuity at a point. Definition of continuity at a point, right? Is that OK? That's it. Of course, in the solutions that I posted last week, um, I also added that the function, the two pieces, the x squared minus whatever, x and the c, x cubed, blah, 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 they are polynomial functions and they are continuous everywhere. I have to mention that as well. Good. Anything else? Anything else? Please add up your points. Make sure that I add it up correctly. I didn't make an error. I apologize if I did, so please show it to me at the end. Is there anything else or we go back to Chapter 3? Chapter 3, I'll stop if you find anything. Chapter 3 has 11 sections. So 3.1 through 3.11. However, the first the first uh, six sections, uh, we do skip one, which is 3.8. So it basically has 10 sections. So we do, we do not do 3.8, OK? So everything else so it's, it has three, 10 sections. Um, so the first, um, the first six sections will be done very quickly. So the rest of four require more time. So moving forward, here's what I recommend. Start working together with me and redo the problems we do in class. I know many of you did that already. So I, 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 I know you already are in the habit of doing the right thing. But um, in general, I'm talking about another specific uh, student. But I'm, I'm hoping that you are going to stay with me and practice and start by looking at the problems we do in class and also practicing the uh, recommended problems right away so you can come back with questions. 
Um, I am going to uh, give a hand up, give you a uh, take home quiz for chapter two. So I will write it and give it to you on Tuesday. And you'll bring it to me uh, on Thursday. Okay? So it's something from the same material that we, we covered. This is nothing new and nothing that you haven't seen so far. Okay, and I'll do the same thing for chapter three. Um, I will replace the lowest test grade with, by the final exam grade, so everyone can still get an A in the class. And I'm hoping that moving forward now you understand what is required. You better understand what is required. So we, can, we are all successful here in this class. Is that okay? Okay. Again, I don't want to lose anyone. I want everyone to move forward with me. Okay. So um, what we, we looked at from section, so the entire chapter is based on um, or deals with differentiation rules. So differentiation rules and differentiation in general. So last time we looked at a couple of um, rules. And um, I also would like to list the ones that we committed to memory so far. Here's what we committed to memory so far. Uh, we know that x to the nth power prime is n x to n minus 1. Okay, since no one said anything, uh, have we done this? Okay, just to make sure. Okay, so also we committed to memory this, which we proved together some time ago using uh, the definition of the derivative. So always remember, f prime is a limit as h approaches 0 from the difference quotient. So f prime exists as long as the limit exists. Otherwise, f prime doesn't exist. And the limit exists from either side if the function has only one tangent. We're going to get to practice that some more. Okay, so what did we say about the square root of x? Very good, awesome. And also we looked at 1 over x prime. If we didn't, we can do it now, but I think we did. It, it was? We did not? That's fine. That's perfect. That's okay. If we didn't, we're going to use this formula right now. So, is there another way of writing 1 over x? Very good. So, now I would like to use the power rule to differentiate. So, x to negative 1, everything prime. I bring negative 1 in front and I subtract 1 from the power. What do I get when I subtract 1 from negative 1? It may be locked. Yeah. So is there another way of writing this? That's it. So we do have to commit this to memory as well. It will come in very handy, especially when we get to integration going backwards, in other words. Okay? Now, uh, we also, I think we did, correct me if I'm wrong, did we look at the derivative of e to the x? Yes. Okay, how much is e to the x prime? E to the x. Very good. And now one more item, limit as h approaches 0, from e to h minus 1 over h. How much is that? One. Yes, indeed. It is 1. We looked at that last time, before the test. Perfect. So this is all we need in 3.1. There is nothing else. Uh, I think we only got the chance to practice with one problem or none at all. Now just remind me. Did we look at any problems? Just one. So uh, on page 181, I'm going to choose a few. Uh, let's say 16.
on 181. So the target today is to go through sections 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3, which means you have some work over the weekend to look at the problems we, did in, we do in class and, and then start working on the checklist, but not before you look at the recommended problems and check the answer in the back. Okay, good. So um, 16 has uh, h of t is a function h of the independent variable t, and it has the fourth root of t minus 4e to t. I like this book. We've been using it for a long time, but I don't think there is any particular problem that is very, very easy in this book. So I think that they, they have a fair amount of difficulty. Okay, so we are asked to find h prime of t. There is no problem here, but I really don't like um, dealing with this unless I change it into a power. So the best thing to do is rewrite the fourth root of t as t raised to which power? One fourth, very good, minus four e to t. And now it's easier to differentiate. I bring down the power, which is one fourth, multiplied by t, and from one quarter, I subtract one. So that must be negative three fourths. And the rest is easy. I would say, because e to the x prime is e to the x. And the constant is the constant in front. Now, here's a typical example, because I want to ask you a question with this one. y equals the square root of x plus x divided by x squared. We don't know how to differentiate the ratio yet, but since this is just one term, we will separate the fraction. So I will write the square root of x divided by x squared plus x over x squared. That is the easiest thing to do first before differentiating. And then I have to copy x <clears throat> from power, the square root is what power? Yes, from one half I have to subtract two plus I simplify an x, and I get 1 over x, which is x to negative 1. Remember, from 1 half, I subtract 2 over 1. I have to find the least common. Yes, please. Why did you, so why did you subtract 2? Uh, say it again. Why you subtract because um, because um, every time I divide two exponential notations having the same base, I copy the base, and from the exponent of the numerator, I subtract the exponent of the denominator. That's the rule. So if I have a to n over a to m is a to n minus m. That's the exponential rules that we have to use. So why did you subtract three fourths and one Here. So uh, the uh, power rule says that when I differentiate x to a power, I bring the power in front and I subtract one from the power. So I bring the power in front, and I subtract 1 from the power. So from 1 quarter, I subtract a dollar. I am left with negative 3 fourths. So here, we're finding the least common denominator. So obviously, I have to multiply the top of the second one, 1 minus 4. So this is negative 3. So this will be x to negative 3 halves plus x to negative 1. After all this preparation, I can find y prime or dy over dx. We're going to use this a lot in this chapter. That's another notation. At the end of the uh, checklist for chapter 2, um, we listed all different possible notations. So that's another notation, and this is the same thing with f prime of x. They're all the same. But we will prefer this notation later on in this chapter, and you'll, you'll see why. So all these mean the same. So y prime equals, I bring down the power, and I subtract 1 
from the power. So negative 3 halves minus 2 over 2, which is minus 1. So this is minus 5 halves. And then minus, I bring the power in front, and I subtract 1 from the power. And you're at this stage, you don't have to do anything else with that. In the next chapter, which is going to be chapter 4, then we are going to add something very important here in which we will have to simplify as much as possible. Any questions? Okay, so um, I would like to look at uh, problem 35 now. And this is on page 182. Find equations of the tangent line and normal line to the curve at the given point. So they want equations of tangent and normal lines. Let me explain what that means and then we'll copy the rest of the problem. Any questions so far, please? Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so let's suppose we have a function, and this is f of x, and let's suppose we have a point on this function, and at that point I will draw the tangent. So this is the tangent, and at the same point I will draw a perpendicular line to the tangent line. This will be the normal line. So for the given function, now let's copy it. It's um, y equals x to the fourth plus 2 e to the x. We are given the point, which is 0, comma 2. We are asked to determine two equations. We are asked to determine the equation of the tangent line, and we are asked to determine the equation of the normal line. What do we know about uh, two this what do we know about two, the slopes of two lines that are perpendicular? Negative. Correct. Very good. So m1 multiplied by m2 equals negative 1. This is the way I like to remember it. You like to remember it like this, which is absolutely the same thing. If you cross multiply, you get the way I like to remember it. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. It's just easier for me to say the product is negative 1. Then to say one is the multiplicative inverse, the negative multiplicative inverse of the other. Just for simplicity. Product, negative one. Good. So how do I find the equation of the tangent? So I have y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1. I have the point 0, comma 2. But the question is, how do I find the slope of the tangent line? Well, I have the tools now to determine the slope of the tangent line without using the definition of the derivative. So I have to find f prime of x first, and then I will find f prime of after I find f prime of x, what will I have to plug in? Of course, that's the point. Very good. So let's find f prime of x first. Without, if I don't have the function, I cannot find f prime of 0. So f prime of x will be 4x to the third plus 2e to the x. Agreed? We bring 4 down. We subtract 1 from the power. And 2e to the x prime is 2e to the x. Everything OK? OK. So then when I plug in 0, this is 0, and e to 0 is e to 0 is 1. 1 times 2 is 2, so this must be 2. So I have the slope. Now I have every piece of information I need to find the equation of the tangent line. Agreed? So I have y minus 2 equals 2 times x because this is 0, and then I add 2. So y equals 2x plus 2 is the equa equation of the tangent line at the point 0, comma 2. 
I will re yes. Sorry? So that final zero is always going to be the slope? Or so that slope is always going to be the slope? So if you remember, we said that the derivative is the function that gives the slope of the tangent line to the graph of a function at any point where the function is differentiable. This function is differentiable everywhere. It's a sum of two continuous functions with no cusps, no corners, and no vertical tangents. So um, this is differentiable everywhere. So once I find the derivative, I can plug in any number I want, and that will give us a slope of the tangent line to the graph of the function at that point. That's the definition of the derivative. So why is it zero? Because the, the given point. Oh, no. Okay. It's going to stream forever because I don't know where it is. I'm sorry. Don't mind. I... It will stop. So this was given to us. This is the point 0, 2. So we were given the function and we were given the point. So since we are trying to determine, because if, if I change the point, the tangent is totally different. The equation will be different. The equation of the uh, uh, normal line will be different. So we were given the function and we we're given the point. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So now I have the equation of the tangent, but all I have to do now is repeat the process with 0, 2, but with a totally different slope to determine the equation of the normal line. So what will be the slope this time? Negative one half. Right. Because if the slope, if the slope of the tangent line is two, the slope of the normal line must be negative one half. Why? Because the product has to be negative one. So if I know that this is two, this must be negative one half for the product to be negative one. So all I have to do is write y minus 2 equals negative 1 half x and add 2. Negative 1 half x plus 2. And this is the equation of the normal line at the same point, 0, 2. Is this OK, everyone? OK. Uh, let's look at um, 63. On page 183, find the second degree polynomial. I didn't mean to write it down. So second degree polynomial, um, p of x, they say, that fulfills the given conditions. Can anyone give us the most general second degree polynomial, which means quadratic? Yes, but the most general one has a x squared plus bx plus c. How many unknowns we have here? Three. I don't have. I don't know a. I don't know b. I don't know c. How many equations do I have to have in order to determine those three? If I don't have three equations, I will not be able to determine all three. Three variables, three equations. Perfect. So let's see what they want. Find the second degree polynomial p of x such that p of 2 is 5, comma, p prime of 2 is 3, comma, p double prime of 2 is 2. I'm going to copy the polynomial you just gave me. And since p prime is involved, I would like you to give me p prime of x. Since p double prime is involved, I would like you to give me p double prime. So yes? Very good. Three Perfect. Um, I have to differentiate x. What is the derivative of x? What is the slope of a straight line x? 1. 
the slope of a horizontal line is 0, the slope of a of y equals x is 1. So it's plus b. You bring down the power and subtract 1 from the power. 1 minus 1 is 0. x to 0 is 1. So x to the first power prime is 1 times x to 1 minus 1, which is 1 times x to 0, which is 1, assuming that x is not 0. So that's why I get 1. Good. So what about the second derivative? p double prime. way very good perfect so we have actually all this information but we have one condition second and the third so now p of 2 equals 5 gives us an equation p prime of 2 equals 3 will give us another equation and p double prime of 2 equals 2 will give us the third equation and this is our system of three, three equations in three variables. Ready? So the first equation, please. Or we can start with the easy one. Yes, 2a equals? There is nothing I can plug in. It's, there is no x. What about the second one? Two a times Very good. So 4a plus b must equal? Three. Very good. And then the top one? Um, two a or four a Very good. Plus two b. Very good. Plus Very good. Five. That's it. Do we all understand these? So I plugged in the original function 2, and I got 4. I got 4 and 2. So 4a plus 2b plus c must equal 5. Then I plugged in 2 in the derivative. So this is 4a plus b equals 3. And here there is no x, so 2a must equal 2. OK, so let's go from the easiest to the top. So how much is a here? 1. If a is 1, can anyone give us b? Very good. So now let's look at the, at the first one, which uh, in which I replace a by 1 and b by negative 1. So 4 minus 2 plus c equals 5. So this is 2, and I bring it to the other side, so c equals I have 2, and I bring it to the other side. Three. Uh, yes. So what is the polynomial, the only polynomial of degree 2, or quadratic, that fulfills all the given conditions? Um, x squared. Um, minus x plus 3. That's it. Any questions? Any questions? OK, um, I'd like to look at 75 on 183. You're going to recognize the type of problem we had a couple, x squared. And you also had one on um, the checklist, not on the test. So this is a piecewise defined function. The first piece is x squared for x less than or equal to 2. The second piece is mx plus b for x greater than 2. We are asked to find the values of m and b. So find m and b such that f is differentiable everywhere. So that f is differentiable everywhere. meaning on all real numbers. OK, what do I do first? OK, let me 
Let's discuss this together. For a function to be differentiable everywhere, what is the first condition? Continuous. continuous. But that's not sufficient, because not all continuous functions are differentiable everywhere. We have to say continuous. However, that continuous function cannot have a cusp, a corner, or a vertical tangent. So if it's continuous and it has one of these three, it will not be differentiable everywhere. Right? Here's why. If you remember the cusp, there is a tangent here, which is a positive tangent with a uh, slope that is positive. There is a tangent here with a negative slope. So there is no unique tangent. There is no unique tangent. There are two. Now here, this function is differentiable here because there is only one tangent. So at this point, the function is differentiable. So it's continuous, it doesn't have a cusp, it doesn't have a corner, it doesn't have a vertical tangent. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. So first of all, I have to make sure that this function is, as you mentioned, continuous. I will write number one, x squared and mx plus b are polynomial functions. Hence, Continuous everywhere. And that's clear. Polynomial function, continuous everywhere. Number two, I'll say continuity at continuity at of course. That is where the problem could be. So I have to show that the limit, or keep, I have to make sure that this condition is fulfilled as x approaches 2 from the left equals the limit as x approaches 2 from the right and equals f of 2. What function do I put from the left? Very good. What function do I put from the right? Perfect. So in order for this to happen, please tell me what is the limit from the first one? What is the limit from the second one? Very good. And what is f of 2? Very good. Agreed? So what is the first condition? I'm going to call it condition A. Without which we can make this function differentiable everywhere. 2m, 2m plus b must equal 4. That's the first condition, and this is the condition for continuity. However, this is not good enough, because can, continuity does not guarantee differentiability. OK, in number 3, I'm going to find f prime of x for the given functions that I know are continuous and differentiable. And I cannot conclude anything about 2. So I will have to say x less than 2 and x greater than 2. And my next step will be, obviously, what? Like before, I stated that those little pieces are continuous. But then I had to study what happens at 2. Same thing here. I know that the function is differentiable as x squared is differentiable as mx plus b, but I don't know what happens where at 2. So I'm going to write differentiable, differentiability at x equals 2 in a minute. And this problem will be complete. Of course, we have to determine m and b, but the setup will be complete. So what is the uh, derivative of, two x, of x squared? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What is the derivative of mx plus b? Yeah. Very good. That's the der derivative of this, of or the slope of the uh, straight line. Good. Notice that I did not put the equal symbol yet, because I have not studied what happens with the differentiability at 2. 
So coming back here, where did I write that a second ago? But I wrote it a minute ago. Yes. So the derivative as a function is the limit as h approaches 0 from the difference quotient. But what if I have, let me not go back there. Let me write it one more time. What if I want to determine f prime of a? f prime of a is the limit as h approaches 0 or as x approaches a from the difference quotient. So when, is that, when does the limit exist? The limit exists as long as both sides go to the same value. Even if it's undefined here, we don't care. Well, we this defined because we made it continuous anywhere, everywhere, anyway. So, so the differentiability at 2 means that the limit as x approaches 2 from the left equals the limit as x approaches 2 from the right for the derivative. So now I go back. What is the derivative to the left of 2? What is the derivative from the right of 2? Notice that there is no third piece. So the derivative on the left and on the right has to be the same. In other words, it's a unique tangent. This derivative on this side of the point must equal this derivative at this side of the point. So there is only one number, one tangent, not two. So the left-hand side indeed is 4, and the right-hand side is m. And this is our relation B. What is the equation that I have to write? This side is 4. This side is m. m equals 4. Finally, I put a and b together. a was 2m plus b equals 4. And b is m equals 4. The system with two linear equations will give us m and b that make the function differentiable everywhere. So m equals 4. And if m is 4, how much is b? Negative 4. So now I can write the function that is differentiable everywhere. Go back. There was x squared for x less than or equal to negative 2. And mx plus b for x greater than 2. This function is guaranteed to be differentiable everywhere, meaning it's continuous everywhere, and it doesn't have a cusp, corner, or vertical tangent. Does this make sense? Any questions? Any questions? OK. So I think with this and this are these ideas, we can move on to the next section. In the next section, I like a slightly different order than it's presented in the book, but I support your decision and agree with your decision if you prefer the method in the book. So 3.2 is the product and quotient rules. So when we differentiate the sum or the difference, like we saw a few minutes ago, we just differentiate as if 
we have just a derivative of a function, right? So if I have, for example, x squared plus 4x, I differentiate the first function plus I differentiate the second one, and I'm done. But every time we have a product of two functions, is not that simple. And no, this is not what you would expect. The answer is not what you would expect. And here's the answer. f prime of x multiplied by g of x and plus f of x multiplied by g prime of x. This is the product rule. I like this order as the first function multiplied by the second function prime. And I write 1 prime times 2 plus 1 times 2 prime. I'll show you what the book says. They are twisting it, or I am twisting it, depending on which angle you want to look at. So they say fg prime is fg prime plus gf prime. <laughs> so I like to keep it in that order. But they are twisting the second one instead of putting it first. But that's OK. So if you prefer this, please use it. That's fine. I like to keep it in the order 1, 2, 1, 2. 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. Let's look at an example before we look at the quotient rule. Um, yes, let's uh, look at problem 3 on page 189. So f of x equals x to the third plus 2x, everything multiplied by e to the x. I would say that this is function 1, and this is function 2. And if I want to differentiate and find f prime of x, I will differentiate the first function. Can anyone give us the derivative of the first one? Yes, 3x squared plus 2 times the second function. So here it is. So this is 1 prime, and this is 2, plus I copy 1, and I differentiate 2. But what is the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. There is no need to do anything else. So this is how the product rule works. Again, if you prefer this, use it. I think it's, I, to me, it seems in order instead of twisting it. But you may say, no, I prefer to put the function first and then the derivative, and then the function first and then the derivative. I accept that, too. It's up to you. Uh, let's look at one other problem. Uh, let's say 11, same page, 189 f of y equals 1 over y squared minus 3 over y to the fourth, everything multiplied by y plus 5y to the third. If you ask me to differentiate this function and you do not indicate the method, I will not use the product rule. Absolutely not. I will distribute, simplify. I will get four terms. And then just differentiate those, those terms. We can do that. The problem is not asking us to use a particular method. It says differentiate. Do whatever you want. Now, if you want to practice the product rule, we should use the product rule. But I will not use the product rule on this particular problem myself. But it's up to you. I'll let you decide. You want to simplify or you want to use the product rule? OK, perfect. So f prime of y, even if I use the product rule, I will still replace this by y to negative 2. I will still replace this by 3y to negative 4. So I'm differentiating the first function. What do I get? Negative 2y to negative 3. Perfect. 
Then I bring down negative 4, but there is a minus in front. Plus 4 times 12, times 3 is 12, sorry. I have to multiply by 3. I bring down negative 4, but there is a 3 in there. So positive 12, y to negative 5. So this was just this piece. Now I have to multiply by the second function and leave it alone. So this is y plus 5y to the third plus. I copy the first function, which is y to negative 2 minus 3y to negative 4. But now I have to differentiate the second function. What would you say? The derivative of y is 1 plus 15y squared. And you can leave it as is. It would have been much easier to um, simplify it, and we would have had a much simpler uh, situation. But now it's, um, you know, it is what it is. Can you, can you also do that by simplifying? Yes. Let's try the simplifying part. Yes, let's do that. So first we have to rearrange f of y. So I will distribute y to y to negative 2, and I get y to negative 1. I will distribute y to negative 3, y to negative 4, and I will get negative 3, y to negative 3. So far, so good. So I distributed y to y to negative 2, and I got y to negative 1. I distributed y to negative 3, y to negative 4, and I got negative 3, y to negative 3. Now I'm distributing 5y cubed to this, so it's positive 5y copy the base, add the exponents, and I distribute here and I get negative 15 y to negative 1. I can even further combine like terms because this and this are like terms, and I have negative 14 y to negative 1 minus 3 y to negative 3 and plus 5 y. As you see, I only have three terms versus all this mess. So now f prime of y, I bring down negative 1, so 14y to negative 2. I bring down negative 3, so it's 9y to negative 4, and plus 5. Let's look at the quotient rule now. Any questions? Any questions? Does it make sense? How did you go from negative 14 y to negative 1 minus 2 y to negative 3 plus 5 y to So I have 1 y to negative 1. No, I get that. I get from there to um, here. Yeah. I bring down the power. I multiply by negative 14, I get positive 14 and subtract 1 from the power. I bring down the power, I get 9 and subtract 1 from the power. And then 5y prime is 5. Better? So please ask any questions because if I if you don't ask, I don't I don't know whether you are we are on the right track or not. Okay, so let's look at the quotient rule. So again, the same thing, f of x divided by g of x is a special rule, never to be dealt with in any other way. The numerator of this fraction is the same with the product, but minus in between. So f prime of x times g of x minus f of x times g prime of x over a g not prime, but squared. So the top of the quotient rule is the same with the sum, but there is a difference instead. There is the same with the product, but there is a difference instead of the sum. And the denominator is squared. That's how we differentiate any ratio of two functions. So uh, let's look at problem 14. Same page, 189. So y equals x plus 1 over x cubed plus x minus 2. 